Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from the Savior who has sent us the Spirit, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. The text for us to ponder this day is the reading from the book of Acts that you heard a few moments ago, but especially these words. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is the Word of God. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, and on Pentecost Sunday, it's traditional that we focus on the Holy Spirit. But I think we need to be honest with ourselves. I think we have trouble understanding our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't really have that problem with God the Father because we're familiar with the concept of fatherhood, and, and likewise, we kind of understand Jesus. I mean, his humanity makes him a little more relatable to us. But the Holy Spirit, our relationship with the Spirit is more ambiguous, I guess. You know, sometimes we think about the Spirit as a gift. Peter spoke that way at Pentecost when he said about baptism, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as a helper, Jesus used that language in the upper room when he said, I will send you another helper. Sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as a guide. Jesus told his followers, he will guide you into all truth. And sometimes we even think of the Holy Spirit as almost an impersonal power source, kind of like the force in the Star Wars movies. Jesus once said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So how are we to think about our relationship with the Holy Spirit? Is he a gift, a helper, a guide, a power source? Now these are all biblical ideas, so I guess we could think of the Spirit in any of these ways. But to me, they all seem way too small. Thinking about the Spirit in any of these ways seems to imply that the Spirit is somehow at our disposal that we are the master and he is our servant. I mean, just think about it. When we're given a gift, well, we use the gifts that we receive or we don't use them. It's up to us. Sometimes we put them in a closet and forget about them until we move and then we give them to Goodwill or the Salvation Army. But gifts are used at our discretion based on our will. And, and sometimes we do ask for a helper, but usually only when we're convinced that we can't handle something on our own. And likewise, we do sometimes seek guidance, but again, only if we can't figure things out on our own first. But really, in all of these cases, we remain in charge. And that just doesn't seem right, for we're talking about the spirit of the living God. And God's Holy Spirit is not at our disposal. He's not something we can use when we feel like we need him, but otherwise ignore. No, I think we have it all wrong if that's how we're thinking of the Holy Spirit. For he is not at our disposal. We are at his disposal. We do not get to use him when we want to. No, he gets to use us. We do not control him he controls us. Now, we have a word for this, and it is a good word, but the word makes us a little uncomfortable. I'm thinking of the word possession. So this morning, as we observe Pentecost Sunday and think about the Holy Spirit, I want you to consider the Holy Spirit as the one who possesses his people. And, of course, that makes you and me people who are possessed. Now, we don't talk much about possession. Perhaps that's because possession is a bit unsettling to us or, or maybe even a lot unsettling to us. Have any of you here ever seen the movie The Exorcist or read the book? Raise your hand if you have. Uh, quite a few of you. Well, when we hear the word possession, we think of that, that movie or that book and we think of an evil spirit occupying a helpless victim. Or remember the demon-possessed man who lived among the tombs, as talked about in Mark 5 and Luke chapter 8. I mean, that man had a whole legion of demons possessing him, a whole legion. 
And chains could not contain him. And night and day he ran around that cemetery without clothes, wailing and cutting himself with sharp stones. That's frightening to think about. Or how about the boy with unclean, the unclean spirit that was talked about in Mark chapter 9? He would foam and grind his teeth and become rigid, and the unclean spirit would try to throw him into fire and water in an attempt to kill him? Can you imagine such an existence? Possession to us, then, is a, a horrifying thought. And here's why. Because the possessed has no control. He's completely at the mercy of his possessor. But imagine being possessed by a different kind of spirit. Imagine being possessed by one who aims not to hurt or harm or destroy, but one who restores and comforts and saves. Imagine what it would be like to be possessed not by a legion of demons, but by the spirit of a good and gracious God. But of course, we don't have to imagine that. For that's what happened starting at Pentecost. Jesus had promised his followers that the Spirit would be with the disciples and the Spirit would be in them, that he would possess them. And that promise was fulfilled at Pentecost. On Pentecost, it began with the sound of a rushing wind from heaven filling the house. And then flames of fire rested upon the heads of the followers of Christ. And then the disciples started speaking an inspired, chaotic chorus of foreign languages which they had never spoken before. And then there was the possessed proclamation of the apostle Peter. For under the Spirit's influence, he preached the truth about Jesus, about his death on the cross as a payment for our sins, and about his resurrection to new life, which makes it possible for us to have new life too. Peter preached about the cross and the empty tomb. He preached the truth about Jesus and about the way to eternal life through Christ alone. And because Peter spoke those words that the Spirit gave to him, words about Christ, thousands of people were saved that day. In fact, thousands of people became possessed by the Spirit that day. And it didn't stop with them. For those newly possessed believers continued speaking the possessed words the Spirit gave them. And as they spoke those words, well, things happened. The spiritually dead came to life. Hearts were restored. Lives were transformed. Lives were renewed. And thus, more possessions took place and more speaking the word of God. And as the Spirit took hold of even more lives of those who heard and believed. And that chain of possessed believers speaking possessed words has continued on since that day of Pentecost in our text. And thank God the Spirit has possessed us too. I mean, you know what we confess and believe. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts. In other words, the Holy Spirit has taken possession of me too so that I am no longer my own. I'm no longer in charge of my life. I no longer live under the illusion of, of autonomy or self-determination. For thanks to the Spirit of God, I am now at the disposal of God himself. I'm possessed by the Spirit of the risen Christ. For now and for eternity, he has made me his dwelling place, and he's done the same thing with you too. He has taken up residence in you. You are his possession now too. Thanks be to Jesus. One of my favorite movies is a basketball movie from 1986 called Hoosiers. All right, how many people have seen that one? Uh, quite a few. Gene Hackman played the part of a coach of a small Indiana high school basketball team that goes on to win the Indiana State Basketball Tournament. The movie is loosely based on a true story from back in 1954. And the school in this case was in a tiny, tiny town. And the team only had seven players. One of them was named Strap. Strap was a big farm boy, basically. The son of the town preacher, a very religious kid. But Strap was a lousy basketball player. So he never got put into a game. On the road to the state championship, however, 
during a really crucial game, the team began running out of players. One boy was injured and couldn't play, and then another fouled out. The game was very close. Strap was the last person you'd want to put in under these circumstances, but he was all they had left. So the coach put him in the game. But everyone, the coach, the fans, the other players, hoped and prayed that Strap would not get the ball. And especially they hoped he would not take a shot because they had seen him shoot in practice. But Strap surprised them. On the first play after checking in, he caught a pass, gave a pump fake, and then drove to the basket and scored over the opposing team center. Incredible, unbelievable. And the next play down the court, he got the ball again and without hesitation did a fadeaway jump shot from 15 feet off and drilled it. To everyone's surprise, Strap was single-handedly saving the season for this team. Well, after a bit, the coach called for a timeout to plan for the last couple minutes of the game. And as the players came back to the bench, there was a look on Straff's face that was priceless. As he looked at the coach with kind of a sly grin. And the coach then made eye contact with him and said, Strap, what's gotten into you? And Strap, the son of the preacher, said, The Lord, I can feel his strength. So let me ask you today, what's gotten into you? Quite honestly, I want people to ask that question to you. I want them to ask that question to you a lot because I hope they don't really understand the reason you do all kinds of things in your life. I want them, for example, to ask, what's gotten into you? When they see you volunteering uh, to use your vacation time to go on a short-term mission trip, or when they see you volunteering to help build a handicap ramp for someone you don't even know, I want them to ask, what's gotten into you when you keep going to church, not just every Sunday, mind you, but sometimes even more than that, to hear God's word or to help with the work of the kingdom. I want people to ask, what's gotten into you when they see the way you love your family and make sacrifices for them, or the way you love your neighbors and make sacrifices for them then? I want the world to wonder what makes you so drastically different, so wonderfully weird. And I want them to ask, what's gotten into you? And when they do, I want you to respond just like Strap. The Lord is the answer. Now, you may not always feel his strength, but you can rest assured that the spirit of the risen Christ, who has bound up the strong man and defeated every dark and diabolical power, the spirit has gotten into you. The spirit indeed has possessed you to comfort you, to restore you, to save you by bringing you to the cross of Jesus Christ and giving you faith. But he's also taken possession of you to use you, to comfort, restore, and save others through you, just like he did with the disciples on the day of Pentecost described in our text. Now, unfortunately, there's another spirit who resides in you too. And he resides in me as well. This other spirit doesn't give in so easily. This is the old spirit, the old Adam, the sinful nature. And he clings and he scrapes and he claws and he fights like hell to bring you down. My friends, that spirit must die. Every day he must die. You know, as Lutherans, we talk a lot about remembering our baptism and certainly that is a good thing for us to do. But what is it you actually think of when you remember your baptism? Certainly we can think about the work God did in the waters of baptism to call us to faith and to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. But there's even more to remember about our baptisms. So I want you to think of the baptismal ceremony with me. Do you remember what we do just before we start pouring the water? We renounce. Do you renounce the devil? And the, the new ceremony has three questions. The old ceremony has it. There's one. The new one says, do you renounce the devil? And then the answer is, yes, I renounce him. Let's try that, by the way. Do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce his works? Yes, I renounce them. And then there's a third question. Do you renounce his ways? But before you answer, let's be clear. 
I'm talking about his ways in here, in my heart, and in your heart, and in your words, and in your life. I'm talking about the way he twists us and turns us from beloved children of God into hateful and hurtful, mean-spirited people who don't look anything like the people God made us to be. That third question we ask, do you renounce his ways in your heart and in your brain and in your life? If so, then answer, yes, I do renounce them. And I hope you'll remember your baptism every day then. Every day we need to remember and celebrate what God did for us in baptism, but every day we need to renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. Every day we need to drown that sinful nature inside of us in the waters of our baptism. And every day then we lean into the possession of our soul by the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we lean into that possession, then we go forth in the Spirit's power to live a transformed life so that everyone can see the love of Christ in us. And then we'll want to ask, what's gotten into you? Last Sunday, we actually celebrated Confirmation Sunday here at St. John's, and eight of our young people publicly confessed their faith in Christ and their desire to follow Him and live according to His plan. They pledge then to be faithful in their use of word and sacrament. They pledge to use their talents for his kingdom and to support the work of his church with their tithes and prayers. They pledge to do all that and, quite honestly, even more. Well, what got into them? Why would they make promises like that? And you know the answer. They made those promises because they are possessed by the spirit of our living God. Those desires expressed on their confirmation day came straight from the Spirit. They promised what they did because they are possessed by the Spirit of our risen Lord, and you are too. And at your baptism, the Spirit got hold of you, and I pray then that every day you will remember your baptism, but also remember your confirmation and what the Spirit inspired you to promise to God. Every day, remember your baptism and remember your confirmation day and then let the Holy Spirit take possession of you all over again and lead you into that transformed life, a life lived fully for Jesus Christ, a life lived fully in response to the cross of Jesus. And to that end, I'd like to say a prayer. It's really a blessing, but if you would, please rise. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in these your people, your Holy Spirit. Confirm their faith, guide their life, empower them in their serving, give them patience and suffering, and in time bring them to everlasting life. I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.